Well, good morning, and happy Mother's Day. Before we jump into our, our message for today, I just want to pray for the moms. I want to say, moms, uh, if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be here, uh, and, and so uh, we value you, we love you, uh, we are so grateful, um, and uh, I just want to pray for you right now. And I'm going to pray that every one of you wins that spa day, actually, it's a possibility. Father, thank you for moms. Thank you uh, that you put together this, this way to bring forth life on our, on our planet and bring all of us into this world, and, and God, the, 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 but it, your plan for moms is so much bigger than that, Lord. Um, and so I pray for moms. I pray for, for moms who, whose kids are grown, that you bless them in, in that season of life. For the moms who are raising teenagers, God, really bless them, uh, and Lord, for for those that are raising the young kids right now and just trying to find enough coffee to get through, would you, would you give them everything they need, the wisdom and uh, all that they need to come, come through that season and into the next season where they'll really need blessed. So, Lord, bless them, fill them, and let them know how much you love them and cherish them and how much the rest of us love and cherish our moms. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well... I, Come on in, guys. We've got seats. Uh, if you've got a seat next to you, raise your hand. All right, we've got some seats up front. Come on in. Find a place to sit down. Um, so we're in our, our series, Road Trip. Uh, Jesus, if you're joining us for the first time, if you're a mom here uh, for the mom stuff, uh, look, Jesus lives for 30 years, kind of in obscurity, in the middle of nowhere, in this little area called Galilee, in a town called Nazareth. He turns 30 years old, and he hits the road for a three-year road trip that will change the world. And um, so we're spending some time with him on that road trip, kind of looking in, leaning in, and seeing who he is, what he had to say, how he responded to people, how he treated people. And we're looking at some of the context of, of those interactions because as you spend time with somebody on the road, if you've ever been on a road trip with somebody, you really get to know them. And that was kind of the goal for this series is, hey, let's take some time and just really get to know Jesus because it's all about him anyway. So we're going to get chronologically out of order a little bit. Uh, we've, we went past this, and uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Jesus Kisses his mom goodbye because it was Mother's Day. I'm sure it was Mother's Day. Did you know Mother's Day was invented in, in West Virginia? Did you know that? So I'm sure it was Mother's Day 2,000 years ago. Anyway, he kisses his mom goodbye, and he hits the road, and the very first thing that he does is he travels to see a guy named John. Now, John, you may have heard of him. We call him John the Baptist. Um, but his name was John, and John actually was Jesus' cousin. Really fascinating story. So you may be familiar with the birth of Jesus, and the angel shows up to Mary and says, hey, you're going to have a baby, and I know you've never been with a man before, but you're going to have a baby, and you're like, all right, I'm along for the ride. So anyway, that was all very miraculous, and Jesus, Jesus is born, but there was another miraculous situation that happened before Jesus, and it was John. Uh, John's father uh, and mother were very old. They had never had any children. They were beyond childbearing years. And John's father's name was Zechariah, and he was a priest, and he was in Jerusalem, and he had this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go into the inner sanctum of the temple and make an offering to God. The priest didn't get to do that, but typically once in a lifetime. And so he goes in, and he's making this offering to God, and an angel shows up. A, a pre-Jesus angel, right? An angel shows up and says, hey, Zach, you're, your wife's going to become pregnant. You're going to have a baby. He's going to be a great prophet, which was a big deal because there hasn't been a prophet in 400 years in Israel. Like, okay. And, and so Zechariah's listening, and then he asks this really crazy question. How do I know that this is true? And the angel responds, I'm the angel of God. Like, come on, dude. And... Um, he said, but so that you know that this is true, that you're not just having a hallucination, you're not going to be able to speak until the baby is born. And sure enough, Zechariah comes out of the temple, he can't talk, uh, he does a charades thing, and, the, and all they know is that something happened in there because he can't communicate very well. And, uh, and he goes home, his wife becomes pregnant, uh, and it was in the middle of her pregnancy that the angel shows up to Mary and, and 
talks to her about Jesus. And then Mary, who lives in the north part of the country, comes down to Judea where, where Zechariah and his family is and visits. And uh, so that's the backstory for this guy named John. But the big deal about John was that it had been 400 years since there had been a prophet in Israel. And the people of Israel had been going through the religious motions for 400 years years. And here's what I found out. When you go through religious motions and there's no spirit in it, you drift. You just drift. And, uh, and the people of Israel have, have drifted. I mean, they're very devoted, but they have drifted in their hearts. And that's part of what Jesus comes to address. And, uh, and so, yeah. So we'll pick up there. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. If you brought your Bibles, this is the first book in the New Testament, and it's chapter 3. And um, that's where we'll be. And this is what it says. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. So John shows up. He's a prophet, and he's in the wilderness, and he's got a message. Get your act together. That's not actually what his message was. His message was repent. Now, repent means, uh, it kind of has two primary emphases. One is to, to think differently. It's change the way you're thinking. Like, you've been thinking religious ritual and, and, and just a belief system for 400 years. Change the way you're thinking. The second thing that he was saying, and as we talked about last, last week, you know, you have this You've got this outside-in mentality, and God wants to work from the inside out. Change the way you're thinking about that. But also turn away and go the other direction from the things you know that are wrong in your life. And so he, he says, repent. And, and, and then they quote the prophet Isaiah, and it says, a voice of, this is one who is a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make a straight path for him. So the Jewish prophets of old, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years back, who spoke of a Messiah, a rescuer coming to save the people of Israel, uh, also spoke of a prophet who would come before him to prepare the way for him. And as we learn later in the story, John the Baptist is in fact that prophet. And he came and people wanted to be around John because, man, this is a new thing. We haven't seen this for 400 years. And John was a bit weird It says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. That's a weird dude. I mean, anybody who's dipping bugs in honey and eating it and wearing, you know, I don't know, camel hair jacket is now very trendy, I think, with the arm patches and all that. But but then it wasn't anything. But John had this rock star status because of who he was. He was a prophet, and he was speaking for God, and there was a power with him, and people wanted to be around him. It says people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, the whole region of the Jordan, and they were confessing their sins and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. They're like, we want to get ready for the the coming of the kingdom of God. We want to get our lives right. And I think there's a hunger in people, generally speaking, to to, to be connected with God. I mean, that's that's true to this very day. And, And see, the people were tired of religion and they were hungry for God. And so when John shows up, it's like a drink of fresh water. Everybody wants to go out and hear what this guy has to say. Everybody wants to get right with God. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And so John's out in the middle of nowhere, and people are traveling from Jerusalem. This would be like if you're from around here, you know where Viola is, right? This would be like, let's walk to Viola uh, from downtown Wheeling, and some of you are from Viola, and you're like, amen. All right. And John is baptizing people. Now, when we think of baptism... We think of a religious ceremony or sacrament or something along those lines. But for, for them, that was kind of a new word as far as a, having a religious connotation. It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which literally means to submerge in water or submerge in something, to, to dip. And so it, it didn't have a religious connotation. Now, it had some religious roots. The Jewish people... If somebody wanted to to convert to Judaism who was not Jewish, part of that process was a ritual bath. So they had to do some kind of ritual bath. But this was different. 
the ritual bath, they would go into the water and they would dip themselves in the water, and, and it symbolized it symbolized the, kind of their, their cleansing and, and getting right with God. John the Baptist is inviting people down in the water. He's dipping them in the water. He's not calling it a ceremonial bath or a, a, a ritual bath. It's called baptism, which is, it doesn't, he's not, they're not even using a Hebrew, Hebrew word. They're using a Greek word, this word bap, baptiz, or baptizo. And, um, you know, up to this point, no religious connotation to the word baptism at all. And in fact, from the second century, we have preserved a, a pickle recipe. We don't have the pickles, but we do have the pickle recipe uh, and it, in Greek, and it talks about how you baptizo the pickles in vinegar, and then when they die, they go to heaven. It's just the way that it works. No, I'm just kidding. But we, we, we submerge the pickles in vinegar. It's, it's just a regular, everyday word, but now it begins to take on this, this meaning. And then John the Baptist, nobody's ever been called a Baptist before. Now, we have great authority, on great authority that John was actually not a Baptist, as far as like the Baptist denomination, because he's dipping, he is dipping, his primary food is bugs dipped in, in honey. We know Baptists eat casseroles. Does generally speak, I'm just kidding. Sorry, I, I grew up Baptist, so I can say that. Um, and a lot of potluck dinners. He wasn't going to potluck dinners. He was too strange. He was a pro prophet. So he, he wasn't Baptist, but he was the original Baptist. And the Baptists, the den denomination Baptists, get, derive their name from this guy because they, they have placed such a high value on baptism, which is a good thing, which is a really good thing. So what did it mean? I mean, what, what, how did this evolve and, and what did it mean? Well, John would stand on the banks of the, the Jordan River and he, you know, kind of wild-eyed and I imagine he had a beard because they all had beards and, and, uh, and repent for the kingdom of God is coming and close. You know, turn from, your, turn from the things in your life that you know are wrong. Change the way that you're thinking about God. And people were ready to change the way they were thinking about God because they were hungry for God, not religion. And, and, and so as people made that inward decision, he would say, okay, now, prove it. Come on down in the water with me and let me dip you in the water. Let me baptize you. And it's a public proclamation of, I'm in with John. I believe his message. I'm in with his message. I wanna be a part of the kingdom of God, and I'm in. And it was a public declaration of an inward transformation that starts with a choice to turn and come home to God. Does that make sense? And that's, that's kind of what it was, and that's how it developed. And it, and it just continues. It continues. It's, um, and we'll see this through Jesus' ministry. His disciples are baptizing people all the way along as well. Then, then John shifts gears. All right, so it was a little side tangent for John. Uh, we see the, the religious leaders are now coming from, from Jerusalem because they've heard about John, and he's got this following. And we know enough about those guys that they're jealous of anyone who's gathering a following that's not them. And, and their power is built on, 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 their power is built on kind of an exclusive like they're the only show in town. And so anybody else who shows up, this is why Jesus gets crucified. This is, you know, John the Baptist. They don't really like John the Baptist, but everybody else knows that he's a prophet because they don't have anything to lose, but the religious leaders have some power to lose. And so, so this is what it says. He shifts gears and he turns to the Pharisees and the religious leaders who are coming and says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. This is how you make friends and influence people, right? You brood of vipers. That's a bad thing, by the way. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance? And do not think you can say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Man, prophets, they're just, they have some rough edges, you know what I'm saying? And so he, he tears into these, these religious leaders, 
And he's tying into and expressing a frustration that was shared across the population with, these, with the religious establishment. Because what they had done is they had made their religion about them. It was about, it was about the religious establishment. It was about their looking good, them having control and power. Uh, they were more concerned about people keeping the rules than they were about the people that they were supposed to be serving. And this, again, this drifts over a 400 year period of time, but the people have felt that. And they've watched their leaders sell out to the Romans. They've watched their, their leaders live in the fine houses and the amassing power and wealth. And it's rubbed them the wrong way. And the bigger thing is that they were more concerned with the rules than they were with them. And they'd made it hard for people to get to God. Now, we see this frustration come up over and over and over again on the road trip. Jesus expresses this frustration throughout. And, and, and I believe, Je well, I know Jesus was mad about this situation. And I believe, and I know God was as well. He wanted, God sent Jesus so that God could be accessible. We could have, everyone could have a relationship with him. And here's a group of people keeping people from God in God's name. Make, you, want to, you want to tick God off? Do that. And this is what, this is what he says, or, the, or Jesus says at the end of, of or toward the end of his ministry, he says this expresses a very similar sentiment. Are you ready for this? This is so fun. This is the fun part. They tie up, speaking of the religious leaders, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. So they're all concerned about what people think of them and how they perceive them. He says, they make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. A phylactery is a little box that they would strap to their, their left arm and put scripture verses in. But they had really big phylacteries, you know, because they were more holy. It's kind of like, you know, if they were rappers that have the big watch around their, they have, they have the big phylacteries and their long tassels on their prayer, prayer garments. And, and so they just look, they want to look the part, you know, it's all about that. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Jesus later teaches his disciples, you've seen what they do. Don't do that. Humble yourself, be a humble servant. This is what Jesus pioneers this idea of servant leadership. And it's kind of in response to this. Woe to you, it dropped down to verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea with a single, to win a single convert, and when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much the child of hell as you are. They loved him. You wonder why Jesus got crucified? but he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. He's referring to one of their ceremonial rituals where they would wash their, their we, we wash our plates and, and cups and everything before we eat because we are aware of germ theory. They did, did it because it was part of their religious ceremony. And he's saying, you just wash the outside of the cups, and he's referring to their hearts. You, you, you try and look good on the outside, clean yourself up on the outside, but inside, it's no good. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisee, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of, dead, dead, of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you, all, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So my dog this week found a dead thing in the woods. Right? Anybody, anybody have a dog that finds dead things? Yeah, and he has never rolled in dead things before, but he has found this new guilty pleasure of rolling in dead things. But one of the things that I found about this dead thing is uh, they have a, a bell curve, you know, dead thing bell curve, you know which one I'm talking about? So, so it, it starts out, you know, you're a little stinky, you know, we'll, we'll give you a bath. And then the next day, it's a little more stinky. He came home one day, and he was 30 feet away, and Christy and I both went, 
and our eyes started watering. He's got, I don't know, six or seven baths this week because it's horrible. It took, took me till just the other day to find the dead thing and, and dispose of it. But that's what Jesus is saying. He's like, like you know, your hypocrisy, and, and because you're claiming to represent God, and yet inside, you're as rotten as that dead thing my dog is rolling in. I mean, it is, it's putrid, I don't, and, and, and I don't want anything to do with it. They look good on the outside, but their inner world is rotten, and they claim to represent God, but what, in fact, what they're doing is keeping people from God. So can you feel, because this is important for the rest of the road trip, maybe not so important for today's message, but important for the rest of the road trip that we're going to be on. Can you feel the tension? I mean, there is, this is a flashpoint. It takes three years to, to blow up, but there is, Jesus isn't putting up with it. John isn't putting up with it. Um, there is a tension, and you have to read all these stories and everything that Jesus says and does in regards to the religious leaders through this lens. You've got to understand this. And so John gives us a, a picture into it. And then John shifts gears again, and he points to Jesus. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's like, I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. That would be the role of the lowliest servant. I'm not even worthy to be his lowliest servant, John's saying. I am just the warm-up act. There's somebody coming, and in fact, it's already here. He's the one we've all been waiting for. He goes on, he says, his winnowing fork is in hand, in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable quenchable fire. John's still kind of addressing the religious leaders, I believe. He's, he's kind of got an eye on, on them. He's saying he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. What that means is, you know, when, when they would make, because we're not an agrarian society, so I have to explain all the agrarian metaphors. So when, when you grow wheat, it grows up. The chaff is the, like the, the stalk, and the, and the wheat is up in, in the head of the stalk, and you get the wheat kernels out, and then the rest of it gets burned. And he's saying Jesus, the Messiah is going to separate. Like, no longer are we going to be kind of all intermingled. He's going to separate that out, and it's not going to go well for the people who are just chaff. And then John shifts gears again, or I guess our story shifts gears again, and he points, or Jesus shows up. It says, then, in verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now, here's what we know. Jesus left Nazareth. Again, he kissed his mother goodbye, and he jumped on his Harley, and no, he didn't, he, but he, he, he walked, actually, 60 miles from home to where John was baptizing. Let me, tell me this, when's the last time you've walked 60 miles to do anything? Anyone? Yeah, but not many of us would. Uh, you know, their culture was a little different, and of course, they walked places, but if you're going to walk three days to go do something, it's got to be pretty important to you. And Jesus, baptism is a big deal to Jesus. It's a big deal to Jesus. It's the very first thing he does. Before he does anything else in his public ministry, he goes and gets baptized. Now, Jesus doesn't need to repent. Jesus has never done anything wrong, and his perspective on the kingdom of God is completely accurate. He doesn't need to change the way he thinks, but he gets baptized, I believe at least in part, to demonstrate for us, that this is a big deal. I'm starting off that way, I'm being baptized, he's modeling it for his followers. Not only that, he travels three days to get it done. That's a big deal, that's a big deal. Then he continues throughout his ministry, they're baptizing people. At one point, John's disciples come to, to John the Baptist and say, hey, they're baptizing more people than we are. All the people are going over there. And John was like, well, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. I must become less, and he must become greater. You know, this is, I was here to kind of set him up to get, get things ready for him. And, and so John, or Jesus' disciples, Jesus doesn't actually do the baptizing. His disciples are baptizing people all the way 
along throughout his ministry. And then at the end of his ministry, after he is crucified, buried, rose from the dead, reveals himself to his disciples, hangs out with them for 40 days, and then it's time for Jesus to ascend into heaven, right? This is the last we'll see of Jesus till he comes back. He gathers his team around him. He says, I'm leaving the entire enterprise in your hands, and I want you to do three things. Three things. Help people find me. Help people find me. When they do, baptize them, and then teach them how to follow everything I've commanded you. Help people find me, baptize them, teach them how to follow me. Three things. You know, everybody has a different agenda for what they think church is supposed to be. This was Jesus' agenda. This is what the church is supposed to do. And in fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is, this is part of our mission. You know, we say it around here, helping people find and follow God. That's the mission of the Vineyard Church. We left out baptism because we couldn't find a pithy way to put it in there. But it's in there. We do baptism. I mean, it's it's central to what we do. It's one of the top three things that we do. We help people find God. We baptize them. We teach them how to follow God. When we find this account in Matthew chapter 28, we call it the Great Commission. It reads this way. Jesus is standing on the hillside with his disciples. He's ready to leave. Here's what I want you to do, guys. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And those are the marching orders. And so Jesus, in that moment, commands anyone who becomes a follower of him to be baptized, and then to learn how to follow him. Well, Jesus gets there, comes up to John, it's time for me to get baptized, and John looks at him, and John's got all this going through his head. I'm not worthy to to carry his sandals, he's the Messiah, I'm just this, you know, whatever. And it says, John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Guys, there will always, always be something trying to deter you from being baptized. I've seen this over and over and over again. We, mostly we try and talk ourselves out of it. You know, we'll say things like, well, I would, but what about my hair? You know, I mean, my hair is not going to look good when I come out of the water. And I've got two things to say to you if you're in that boat. One, this is no place for vanity. I mean, Jesus was not thinking about his hair or how he looked when he was hanging naked and beaten half to death on a cross, dying for your sins. And he was saying, look, this is what I want you to do. This is like the obvious next step command of Jesus, get baptized. The second thing that I would tell you, and this might, this might be a little more palatable for you, but you will never look more radiant than when you come out of the waters of baptism. There is something powerful going on inside of you. And brother, let me just tell you, nobody cares about what your hair looks like. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's always good to have a clown in the audience. All right. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, no, he's really a clown. Yeah, I mean, he really is. Um, <laughs> uh, You know, or, or, or I'll, I'll hear this. Well, my family's not here. I want to get the right people in the room and make sure. Everybody, like, guys, we live in 2019. We have video of the entire thing. Seriously. Don't delay in obeying Jesus. Um, another thing that people will say is, well, I was baptized as a baby. I was baptized as a baby. I was born into a denomination that baptized infants. Uh, and later, when I made my own decision to follow Jesus, I realized, oh, Every time baptism shows up in the Bible, it is someone who has made a decision to follow Jesus. I hadn't made a decision as a baby, right? And so, um, and and, and it's a little bit different. Now, if you were baptized as an infant, it's really your parents dedicating you to the Lord and saying, I want to raise this child to know God, and I want to do everything that I can to do that. And so if that's your, your case as it was mine, Be thankful and honor your parents' decision to raise you that way. And it really is kind of a dedication of that child. Now, we do dedications here as well. Without the water, we pray for babies and dedicate them to the Lord because there is a model for that in the Scriptures. But there's not for for baptizing babies. There is a believer's baptism that we see throughout Scripture that once somebody makes the decision to follow Jesus, 
then they are baptized. And that happens over and over and over again throughout the scriptures. So if you were baptized as a baby and you've not been baptized since deciding to follow Jesus, you need to get baptized. You might not have known that. There's a lot of people who don't. Uh, or I know sometimes people will say, well, I was baptized you know, as a teenager. A lot of times we go to camp and everybody else is getting baptized and you're like, well, you know, it's, I'm going to jump in and get baptized too because everybody else is doing it because when, when we're younger, we, we tend to go along with the crowd. But if you didn't own your baptism, if you didn't really dedicate your life to following Jesus at that point, you probably need to get baptized. Because I tell you what, if you get baptized before you become a follower of Jesus, you're just a wet sinner at that point, all right? That's not going to do you any good. Um, and and so, so, yeah, or maybe you went through a series of classes at church, and that was the next step, but you didn't own your faith at that point. You probably need to get baptized because Jesus said, help people find me. When they do, when they become a follower of me, baptize them, all right? So you probably need to get baptized too. Uh, you know, one of the other ways we try and deter ourselves is, is some f- folks will say, I'm afraid of water. I'm like, how did showering work for you this morning? All right. And, I, and I, I know what you mean. I mean, there are some folks who have a legitimate fear of, uh, of going under the water. And I get that. Um, and I, uh, two things for you. One, We have never lost a person in the waters of baptism. You will come out on the other side. I promise you. I promise you. But secondly, secondly, this will not be the the last time in following Jesus that he asks you to do something that's outside your comfort zone. It's part of following Jesus. He calls us out of our comfort zone, and it's different for everyone. So this might be the big one for you, but he's calling you. He says, he makes it so clear, this is the next step in following me. Jesus wants you to be baptized, and so of course, the devil is going to do everything he can to talk you out of it. And he'll do that through your own internal speak as well. You'll you'll, you'll try and talk yourself out of it. Well, Jesus replies to John. What he says is fascinating. He says, let it be so now. Like, John, shut the pie hole. We're going to do this right now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And it says, then John consented. And John decides to baptize him. Once you've decided to follow Jesus, get baptized as soon as possible. You know, the, the, what we see throughout the book of Acts and the New Testament, people are baptized that day. On the first day of the church, 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus, and it says they're all baptized that day. They stayed up really late baptizing people, because 3,000 people would take a while. But they were baptized that day. And more often than not, that's what happens through, throughout the book of Acts and the New Testament, is that people are baptized that day. Get baptized as soon as possible. And then it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Now, this, this is just a descriptor of how Jesus was baptized. He went into the water, and he came up out of the water. We call that baptism uh, by immersion, you know, in, under the water. Some denominations will, will sprinkle or pour water over somebody, and we don't get mad at anybody about that. We really don't argue about it. We just try and follow the biblical model as closely as we can. Jesus was baptized by immersion, and as best we can tell through the scripture, that is the model. Um, and the word baptism, the word baptizo, literally means to immerse in water. So that's what we try and and do here. Now, if somebody has got a medical issue or whatever, we'll pour a pitcher of water over them. And I don't think God gets all wrapped around the axle about the particulars of that. I think he gets more, I don't think God gets wrapped around the axle at all, but I do think God, you know, he's more concerned with when we're baptized, after we make that decision to follow him, than he is about the mode, but we try and follow that biblical model as best we can. That's why we have 600 gallons of water sitting over here. It would be much easier just to pour pitchers of water over people, but we, go the, we, go, we work hard to follow that model as best we can. Then, it says, I love this, at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. All right, so here's what happens. Jesus gets baptized, 
God shows up, the Holy Spirit shows up, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all in one place. God, uh, God's voice booming from heaven, this is my son. Who, God loves baptism. And I've seen this over and over and over again. Whenever there's a baptism service, it's like, like God's in the house. It's powerful. God loves baptism. Jesus said when somebody turns around and comes home to the Father, that all of heaven stops and throws a party. And we get to join with God in the midst of baptisms. And so it's really cool. God loves baptism. Now, what does baptism mean? What does the Jesus, not the John the Baptist, baptism mean? And there's a lot of similarities. But it's a symbol. It symbolizes two things that the scripture lays out for us. One is it symbolizes the washing away of our sins. It doesn't wash away your sins. The water does not wash away your sins. Otherwise, the people who go in after the first per pe person are going to be a mess with sins. No, it doesn't do that. It's a symbol of that. It's also a symbol of being joined, as, jo as the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, of joining with Jesus in his death, we die to ourselves, his burial as we go under the water, and as we come up out of the water, his resurrection to a brand new life. And so it symbolizes that as well. But it's not just a symbol, it's a statement. Just like in John's day, which people said, I'm with John, I believe. People were saying, I'm with Jesus. I believe, I believe what he's teaching, I'm following him. I'm, it is, it is uh, an outward statement of a new inward reality in my life. And so when people are baptized today, what they're saying is, this, this is a picture, a symbol of what God's doing inside. He's cleansing, cleansed me from my sin, I am, I am dying to myself and born a new in him, I got a brand new life, and I am with him. It's going public with your faith. And lastly, baptism is a step of obedience. It's a step of obedience. Jesus said to do this. He modeled it. He went out of his way to do it. He did it throughout his ministry. His disciples baptized people, and then at the end, he commands us to do this and to be baptized. So the question is, who should be baptized? Well, Anyone who has made a decision to follow Jesus and has not been baptized yet. Now, if you have young children, I will put this little caveat on the end there. You want your kids to be old enough to understand the gospel and what it means to follow Jesus. All right, And so if they're, they're too young, they're not going to have the cognitive capability to get their arms around that. And you want them to remember it. You want them to be old enough to point back and go, yeah, that's when I was baptized. And so if they're too young, they're not going to remember it. And so I would encourage you to wait if you have young children who are, you know, who are not, either not going to remember it or not going to understand it or both. Does that make sense? Say yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That is, little interaction's good. All right. When should I be baptized? The first available moment that you can be. And guess what? Today is the first available moment that you can be. Uh, and I know you haven't, been, you haven't prepared for this. And your, your hair is just so, David, a clown. Um, your hair is just so, and, and, and all of that. Guys, this is a no excuse baptism Sunday. We have been preparing for you. We have uh, shorts and shirts and we even have under things and um, everything you need, towels and robes, and you can get baptized and then get dressed again afterwards and, and head on out for breakfast or whatever you're going to do. There's a no excuse, no excuse this weekend. If you've not been baptized and you've made the decision to follow Jesus, today is your day, and it's going, we're going to make it as easy as possible for you. But before we do that, you need to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so, if you've been around the vineyard for any length of time, you've probably heard these stories because I tell them over and over again. There's two stories that I tell because I have not found better stories yet to illustrate what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be a Christian. And the first story, the first story is about two friends who grew up together. One went off to law school, the other went off and ended up in a life of crime. And sooner or later, the guy who went off to law school became a judge, and he's in his courtroom, 
and he's looking at the, the docket of cases, and his friend is in his court, and his friend is guilty. And so the prosecutor lays out this case, and it's evidence upon evidence upon evidence. He is guilty. He is guilty. And his friend wants nothing more than just to say, well, let's just make this go away, because it's his friend. But justice demands that a judgment be made, that, that, that guilt be declared. And so he does. He declares his friend guilty, because he's obviously guilty. And he assigns a penalty for the crime. Then he gets down out of the judge's booth. He takes off his robe. He goes over to his friend, embraces his friend, and walks him over to the window. The judge pulls out his checkbook and writes a check for the full amount of the fine and pays it for him. Guys, that's a picture of what God has done for us. Every single one of us is guilty of sin. Every one of us has turned our back at on God at one point or another and walked away and done it our way, done our own thing. And we've hurt other people and we've hurt ourselves and we've hurt God. And the penalty for that is death. That's what the scripture says. And rather than force us to pay a penalty we could not survive, God put on skin and came down as the person of Jesus Christ and died on a cross voluntarily to pay for your wrongs. That when we put our faith in him, when we look to him and we decide to follow him, that that payment is applied to our account and our sins are completely blotted out. We get a brand new start and we can follow him. And at that point, he comes and lives in our hearts and we live a whole different kind of life. It's called eternal life. It starts that moment. The other story that I love to tell is of my friend Mike. When I was in college, I had a friend named Mike, and he had a, a two-year-old daughter. One day, he heard her on the baby monitor and went up to her room. She had woken up from a nap, and he walked in the room, and much to his shock, she had gotten into her diaper, and she had wiped baby poop everywhere. I mean, all over her face, in her ears, in her hair, all everywhere. It was in the, the crib, on the wall. It was the biggest mess of baby poop you've ever seen. And so he walks in the room, right, and he looks at his daughter, and she can't talk yet, but she kind of stands up and arms up like if she could talk, she'd say, Daddy, pick me up. And he looked at her, and he's like, there ain't no way I'm picking you up. <laughs> that is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And so he gets a couple rags, and he goes over, and he gets her like this, and he, and he walks her over to the bathtub, and he, he squirts her off and shampoos her up and gets all that stuff out of her ears and everything else and gets her completely clean. And then he wraps her in a towel, and he picks her up into his arms like she wanted him to and like he, of course, wanted to. It's his baby girl. And that is such a picture of what we deal with in this life because all of us have sinned, and sin is more disgusting than baby poop and a whole lot stickier. The only thing that washes the sin off of our life is the death of Jesus. And God created you to be in a relationship with you, to hold you and to live inside your heart. And all he wants to do, and he sent Jesus because we've got this sin problem that we have to take care of. And, and Jesus comes and he power washes our life and then the Spirit of God, who is holy and perfect, can come and live inside of our hearts and lead us, and we follow him. And that, my friends, that's the Christian faith. That's different than anything you're going to find in any uh, philosophy or other religion. That's God doing what needed to be done to get to us, not us trying to get our act together or somehow clean enough of the baby poop off to get to him because you'll never clean enough off. You need to be power washed. Guys, God loves you the way my friend Mike loved his daughter and loves his daughter. And he wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to forgive your sin. But you have to turn to him, place your faith in him, follow him. And man, life changes. And if you've never done that, if you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. And it really, it's, it's, it, it's a two-step process. The first step is turning around and going, God, I want to do that. And then the second part of that process is each day choosing one step at a time to follow him. 
And so if you want to turn around today, come home to God. I want to invite you to pray with me. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Um, and uh, let's just close our eyes, bow our heads. And you can pray with me. Something along these lines. Just say, Father, I'm covered in it. I am a sinner. And I believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for my sins. Would you, would you wash my life? Would you forgive my sin? Would you wash it all away? Give me a brand new start. I choose today to follow you. And I ask, Lord, that you would come and live in my heart and lead my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, if you've prayed that prayer and it's the first time you've ever prayed a prayer like that, awesome, greatest day ever. Let's give those folks a round of applause. Your next step is to get baptized, and you can do that today. And if you have made the decision to follow Jesus, but you've not been baptized, you can do that today. And here's how this is going to work. We're going to, I'm going to kind of make my way off the platform. Mike and the band are going to come back up. We're going to receive our offering. After all of that, when everybody stands up to sing, may, and you need to be baptized, make your way out the back. We have a team of people in the lobby waiting to, to meet you and help you get situated and ready to go, and we'll baptize you this morning, and it's going to be awesome, okay? That's how that's going to work. So, the rest of us, you know your job if you've been around for a while. There's a party going on in heaven. We're joining the party, so let's celebrate, sing, play the drums really hard, Johnny V, and let's make this thing happen today. We're going to have church this morning, all right? Let's pray. <laughs>